Welcome to an enlightening podcast from IslamPodcasts.com. We encourage our listeners to please comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please remind your family and friends to also visit IslamPodcasts.com for engaging discussions on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran, Tafsir, Sira, and much more. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Podcasts on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran, Tafsir, and Sira are available at islampodcasts.com as well as on iTunes. Rate, review, and comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about islampodcasts.com as well as rate, review of iTunes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Reflections on Muharram and lessons from the tragedy of Karbala. Alhamdulillah, we have entered into the new year of 1439 Hijri with the month of Muharram, the first month of the Islamic calendar. It is a month of great reward and virtue. Muharram itself means sacred and is from those months which have been mentioned as sacred in the text. Imam Ahmad recorded that Abi Bakr radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during his Hajj said, the division of time has turned to its original form, which was current when Allah created the heavens and the earth. The year is of twelve months, out of which four months are sacred. Three are in succession, Dhul Qaida, Dhul Hijjah and Muharram, and Rajab, which comes between Jumada Thania and Sha'aban. From out of the four sacred months, Muharram has been blessed with certain specific virtues. The Prophet ﷺ said, The best of fasts besides the month of Ramadan is the fasting of Allah's month of Muharram, recorded in Muslim. In another hadith, Ibn Abbas an reported, the Prophet ﷺ said, The one that keeps a fast in the month of Muharram will receive the reward of 30 fasts for each fast in this sacred month, recorded in Tabarani. Furthermore, when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, he found the Jews fasting on the day of Ashura, i.e. the 10th of Muharram. They used to say, this is a great day on which Allah saved Musa and drowned the people of Fir'aun. Musa observed the fast on this day as a sign of gratitude to Allah. The Prophet said, I am closer to Musa than they. So he observed the fast on that day and ordered the Muslims to fast on it. Narrated by Ibn Abbas recorded in Bukhari. It is reported also that Ibn Abbas used to say, we should fast on two days, the 9th and the 10th of Muharram, to distinguish ourselves from the Jewish community, recorded in ar tirmidhi In this month of Muharram, like any other month of the year, there are many important events that took place from which the Muslim generations can learn many lessons. However, today we are going to focus on one of the most important events that took place in this month and on the 10th of Muharram, and that is the Shahada of the grandson of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu an and his family and friends at the hands of other Muslims. This event and the incidents that led up to this tragedy need to be reflected upon by every Muslim for all times so we can learn valuable lessons from it and refresh our commitment in the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us start by reviewing the main events that was the root cause of the issue. Near the end of Muawiyah's reign as Khalifa, he opted for hereditary rule and took steps to introduce this into the mechanics of rulership and sought to place his son Yazid over the Khilafah. Historians like Ibn Kathir and Ibn Al-Athir narrated that after his walis had failed to pledge the bayah, oath of allegiance, to Yazid in Hijaz, Muawiyah went there himself accompanied by the army and bearing lots of wealth. He summed the prominent figures and said to them, You have known my conduct towards you and my family ties with you. Yazid is your brother and your cousin. I want you to propose Yazid for the Khilafah so that you would be the ones who remove and appoint, who put people in authority and collect and distribute the funds. Abdullah ibn al-Zubair radiallahu an, the companion of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, replied to him that he should either choose what the Prophet ﷺ did by not designating anyone, or what Abu Bakr al-Sadiq or Umar ibn al-Khattab had done. Muawiyah became angry 
And when he asked the rest of the people, the reply was the same as Ibn al-Zubayr an. Upon this, Muawiyah said, You have been warned. I am going to speak a word and I swear by Allah that if any of you reply to me by uttering a word on that occasion, he would not utter another word before the sword had reached his neck. So every man has only to spare himself. Then he ordered the chief of his guards to place two men behind every prominent person of Hijaz and every opponent, with instruction that if any of them answered back, to strike his neck with their swords. He then climbed up to the podium and said, This group of people are the leaders and the best amongst the Muslims, and no decision is taken without them, and no matter is settled without their consultation. They have consented and given the bayah, so do give your bayah in the name of Allah. This was the basis on which Muawiyah established the system of appointing a crown prince. However, the Sahaba as a whole did not agree with him for this was a violation of the bayah process. Muawiyah was getting older day by day. At the age of 75, he became seriously ill and died in the middle of the month of Rajab, 60 after Hijri. Since Hassan ibn Ali had already passed away before Muawiyah, a political vacuum had developed as he was the only other possible candidate for the position of Khalifa. Yazid took advantage of this situation and wrote a letter to Walid ibn Utbah bin Abu Sufyan, who was appointed the governor of Medina by Muawiyah to demand the bay'ah from Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu an, or else upon refusal, his head. Walid invited Hussein to a meeting for this purpose, but Hussein did not give his word at this meeting and decided to leave Medina along with his family to proceed to Mecca. When Hussein reached Mecca, he received letters from Kufa urging him to go there to become the Khalifa. Hussein sent an emissary, his cousin Muslim ibn Aqil, to Kufa to ascertain first-hand information about the situation in Iraq. Hussein also knew that giving the bay'ah to a usurper like Yazid would certainly place Islam at great jeopardy. Therefore, he decided to leave Mecca for Kufa. Many friends and relatives urged Hussein not to go to Kufa, but he insisted on going. Hussein, along with his family, friends and companions, began the journey towards Kufa. During this journey, he received the first letter from his emissary, Muslim ibn Aqil, with good news. The letter indicated that the people were more than ready to welcome Hussein in Kufa and were looking forward to his leadership. Hussein decided to send another emissary to Kufa with a message. The caravan kept proceeding towards Kufa. Many days passed, but Hussein did not receive any more responses from Muslim ibn Aqil in Kufa. Muslim ibn Aqil in Kufa, however, with the help of Mukhtar al thaqafi and Hani ibn Urwa, continued to hold meetings with the supporters of Hussein. Within a short period of time, the gathering started to gain momentum. Yazid learned about Muslim ibn Aqi's success in Kufa and appointed Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad to replace al numan ibn al-Bashir radiallahu an as wali of Kufa. Meanwhile, as Hussein's caravan got closer to its destination, coming to place called Zubala. Hussein unexpectedly received shocking news about Muslim ibn Aqil and the person who provided him shelter, Hani ibn Urwa, both of whom were arrested and beheaded by the governor ibn Ziyad. Mukhtar was also arrested, imprisoned and tortured by ibn Ziyad. Hussein gathered his companions and disclosed to them the bad news. Becoming scared, some companions left the caravan. Hussein, however, continued with the journey along with close companions and family members until he was face to face with 1,000 horsemen led by Hur al Rayahi, representing Yazid's forces, who had by now caught up with the caravan. The army blocked the camps of Hussein from advancing, and tension started to rise between the two sides. Hussein addressed the other side, explaining to them his motive for going to Kufa was in response to the invitation of the people. He even showed them a full bag of letters he had received from Kufa. Hur said that he and his men were not the writers of those letters. Hussein told them that if they did not like him to advance with the journey, he was prepared to return to Hijaz. Hur replied, We are commissioned to follow you until we take you to Governor Ibn Ziyad, and suggested to Hussein to go somewhere that is neither Kufa nor Medina. Hussein found the proposal to be fair and turned the caravan away from Kufa. Hur and his army marched parallel to Hussein. The two sides reached a village called Nainawa, 
where Ibn Ziyad's messenger delivered a new message to Hur. The message read, Force Hussein to a halt, but let him stop in an open space without vegetation or water. Hur conveyed the contents of the letter to Hussein. Hussein defiantly resumed his journey and reached a place where another force blocked his move and forced him to stop. When Hussein learned that the place was called Karbala, he ordered his camp to be set up. This was on the 2nd of Muharram, 61 after Hijri. Upon learning that his army had succeeded in laying siege around Hussein's camp, Governor Ibn Ziyad sent additional military units to Karbala and appointed Umar Ibn Sa'd in charge. Hussein opened a dialogue with Umar Ibn Sa'd and convinced him to lift the siege so that Hussein with his family and companions could leave Iraq. Umar ibn Sa'd liked Hussein's proposal and sent a message to Governor ibn Ziyad notifying him about the result of the talks with Hussein. Ibn Ziyad also found Hussein's proposal acceptable. However, before agreeing to it officially, Shimon bin Dil Jaushan opposed it strongly. As a result, Ibn Ziyad wrote a letter to Umar ibn Sa'd commanding him to either go to war with Hussein or be relieved of his duties as a commander of the army and Shimr will not only replace him but dispatch Ibn Sa'd's head to Kufa as well. Umar ibn Sa'd got the letter. After pondering over the consequences, he decided to fight Hussein. On the seventh day of Muharram, he moved his troops closer to the camp and began to surround the camp. Ibn Sa'd laid a blockade around the camp to cut it off from access to the river Euphrates, to deprive it of water in a move to force them to surrender. Two days later on the 9th of Muharram, the forces loyal to Yazid closed in on the camp of Hussein. He asked his brother Abbas to talk to Ibn Sa'd and request a delay of the aggression by one night. Omar ibn Sa'd agreed to the request. He ordered his troops to delay the aggression until the following morning. Hussein and his companions spent that night in prayer. Finally, the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, dawned. It was the day in which Muslim blood would be shed and 72 innocent lives were sacrificed. In the morning, Hussein went out of the camp and saw Omar ibn Sa'd mobilizing his troops to begin the battle. He, start, he stared at the intimidating army, and as large as it was, Hussein showed no signs of compromise. Hussein raised his hands to Allah and said, O oh Allah, it is you in whom I trust amid all grief. You are my hope amid all violence. You are my refuge and provision in everything that happens to me. How many grievances weaken the heart, leaving me with no means to handle them during which friends desert me, and my enemy rejoice in it. I lay it before you and complain of it to you, because of my desire in you, you alone. You relieve me of it and remove it from me. You are the master of all grace, the essence of goodness, and the ultimate resort of all desire. Omar ibn Sa'd shot an arrow in the air to indicate the start of the battle. Hussein's supporters insisted on being the first to fight. They took the brunt of the enemy attack. The battle was ferocious. Within a short time, Hussein's supporters slew a large number of the opposing fighters, and apprehension and confusion arose in Ibn Sa'd's forces. The 72 people of Hussein's force were pitted against a 5,000 strong army. So worried and nervous did the opposing side become that the commander in chief ordered his army to set fire to the tents which were occupied mostly by frightened women and children, and he reinforced his fighters with more troops. By noon time, Hussein stopped the fight to perform the Salah. By this time, those left were mainly his family and a few supporters. They performed the Salah together. Two supporters were guarding the performers of the Salah. When the Salah finished, one of the guards fell dead. There were 17 arrows in his back. Ali Akbar, Hussein's son obtained permission to fight and dashed towards the enemy. He engaged them in fierce combat 
and he continued to move forward deep inside the enemy line. The opposing force eventually overpowered him, cutting him with swords and spears, and his body became nothing but wounds, gushing blood until death. Hussein rushed towards him and picked up the wounded limp body and brought it to his camp. His sister and others in the camp were horrified and shocked to see this. Abbas and five other brothers of Hussein went to fight next. They also engaged the opposing force fiercely in the fight. Abbas went towards the river to bring some water for the thirsty children. While he was returning on his horse with the water, he was attacked by a large horde of the opposing force, overwhelming and severely wounding him. As much as he tried, Abbas could not save the water, and he fell from his horse to breathe his last. Next to the battlefield went the sons of Hassan and Zainab, and their cousins, about seventeen of them in total. They were all in their teens, but each fought bravely. By the afternoon, seventy people from the family and companions of Hussein had lost their lives in Karbala. All had fought under nerve-wracking conditions, severe thirst, dehydration, exhaustion, and agonizing feelings of what would happen to the family of the Prophet ﷺ afterwards. Hussein endured all of this and more, for he saw all his beloved ones killed, including children. Being the only one left, Hussein was to face the enemy head on. Precisely at that moment, Hussein heard his baby crying incessantly, agonizing because of the thirst. Hussein's love for his family was unbound, especially for a suffering baby. He held the six-month-old baby, his youngest son Ali Asghar, in his arms and appealed to the enemy fighters for some water for the baby. Hussein wanted to awaken the Islamic feelings, but the stone-hearted force of Ibn Sa'd had been corrupted by political intrigue, and instead of giving water, they fired an arrow towards the agonizing baby and killed it, instantly. Hussein was shocked. He felt an unbearable wave of pain. He filled his palm with the blood of the baby and threw it upwards towards the sky, beseeching Allah, O oh Allah, my Lord, my consolation is the fact that you in your majesty are witnessing what I am going through. Hussein was alone, one man against thousands. Thirdly, constantly accounting subordinates. Omar ibn al-Khattab was known to be strict when accounting the walis and the Ayman's. He would even remove some of them on just a suspicion without conclusive evidence. He even used to remove a wali on the slightest doubt that did not even reach the level of suspicion. He was asked about this one day and he said, It is easy to swap an emir for another so as to amend the people's affairs. Another lesson we learn from this is that the Khalifa must constantly inquire about the work of his walis and he should monitor them closely. The Khalifa should appoint someone who would check their state of affairs and carry out inspections. The Khalifa should also meet with all of them or some of them from time to time and listen to the complaints of the subjects against them. It has been confirmed that the Prophet ﷺ used to examine the walis when appointing them as he did with Mu'ad ibn Jabal and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhuma. He used to explain to them how they should conduct their duties as he did with Amr ibn Hazim radiallahu an. It has also been confirmed that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to hold the walis to account, inspect the situation and listen to news brought to him about them. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to ask the walis to account for the revenues and expenses they spent. Fourthly, walis should have restricted authority. Muawiyah was appointed wali of Assyria and Iraq with general powers, i.e. a general wilaya. He had full control over the armed forces, the finances, the judiciary, the police force, the economy, the administration and all other aspects of ruling. It can be seen that had the powers of Muawiyah been limited, he might not have been able to muster the support needed to find Ali radiallahu an, or award his son Yazid eventual leadership. In the wake of Uthman radiallahu an's death, Ali had problems getting Muawiyah to come under his authority. This was because Muawiyah had built a strong power base when he was a wali over Asham. Therefore, Giving a general wilaya caused a known harm to the Khilafah. 
Thus, the wali should be given a restricted wilaya in a way that would prevent him from becoming autonomous over the khalifa and strengthening the khalifa himself. The main factors contributing to a breakdown would be the armed forces, funds and the judiciary because the armed forces represent the power, the funds represent the lifeblood and the judiciary demonstrates the safeguarding of the rights and the execution of the penal codes. Therefore, the wali should be given a specific khas wilaya that excludes the judiciary, the armed forces and the funds. He took them on fighting them bravely, and kept fighting, receiving many wounds in the process. Thousands of fighters were surrounding him, but none dared to move towards him. The silence was broken when Shima screamed for an attack, and then screamed again, threatening. In response, they attacked collectively, and one sword fell on Hussein's left wrist and deeply cut his left hand. Blood gushed. Another sword soon followed, and it hit his upper back. Hussein felt numb as he fell to the ground, bleeding profusely. He was at the point of shock. Even though staggering, he tried to stand by leaning on his sword. Then he received the fatal blow. It was at this point that Shimon came forward and severed Hussein Radiallahan's noble head from his body. This noble head that had been kissed often by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shimon and others had the audacity to carry it on the tip of a spear to Yazid 600 miles away. Yazid never received the bay'ah by consent and selection, and thus never held the seat of Khalifa legitimately. He was a usurper mutasallit. From a Sharia perspective, if a usurper were to seize power by force, he would not become Khalifa even if he declared himself to be the Khalifa of the Muslims. This is because the Khilafah in this case would not have been contracted to him by Muslims properly or legitimately. If he were to take the bay'ah from the people by force and coercion, he would not become Khalifa even if the bay'ah was given to him. This is because a bay'ah that is taken by force and coercion is not considered valid and therefore the Khilafah cannot be legitimized. It is a contract based on mutual consent and choice and cannot be concluded force forcefully or by coercion. The Khilafah cannot therefore be concluded except by a bay of consent and choice. However, if the usurper managed to convince the people that it would be in the interest of the Muslims to give him their bay'ah, and that the implementation of the Shura rules obliges them to give the bay'ah, and they were convinced of that and accepted it, and then gave him the bay'ah by consent and free choice, he would only then become Khalifa from the moment that the bay was given to him by consent and choice. This never happened in the case of Yazid, and the Muslims were correct in trying to secure the bay for the man whom they wished to pledge allegiance to. Lessons from the Tragedy of Karbala Karbala is amongst the worst tragedies humanity has ever seen. However, it also provides vital lessons that we must learn and apply. Firstly, bayah is the only method to appoint the Khalifa. It must be given by consent and choice. The bayah is the only Islamic method to appoint the Khalifa. We can see clearly that Yazid never received the bayah by consent and choice. Indeed, his father took the bayah by force for him, and he subdued any opposition to his power by force. A vital lesson to learn is that, just like any contract, the bear cannot be taken by coercion, but it must be based on consent and choice. Secondly, rotating walis frequently. It can be seen that one of the reasons that allowed Muawiyah to gain such popularity and build a strong support base in Syria, which later allowed him to appoint Yazid, was that he was allowed to remain in the position of wali for over 20 years. It will be considered wise political maneuvering for the Khalifa to change his walis regularly. The Prophet ﷺ used to appoint walis for a period of time and then relieve them, and no wali remained at his walaya during the whole era of the Prophet ﷺ. This indicates that the wali should never be appointed on a permanent basis in one locality, but only for a short period after which he is removed. 
However, evidence about the length of this period, i.e. whether it should be for long or short, has not been gleaned by the actions of the Prophet ﷺ. What has been established as a fact is that he used to appoint the walis and then relieve them. Fifthly, conditions of the wali. The Prophet ﷺ used to select his walis from amongst the good people and those who had knowledge and were known for their piety. He used to select them from amongst those who were experts in the field and who would fill people's hearts with iman and respect for the state. Suleiman ibn Barida reported on the authority of his father that he said, whenever the Prophet ﷺ appointed an Amir over an army or an expedition, he used to advise him regarding himself to fear Allah and to be good to the Muslims who accompany him, recorded in Muslim. Since the Wali is in fact an Amir over his Wilayah, the Hadith would then apply to him also. Appointing Walis and rulers devoid of these qualities will lead to the problems mentioned earlier. Sixthly, the massacre of Karbala has highlighted the importance to Muslims to always stand steadfast in dealing with oppressive rulers. The rulers of the Muslim world today have not been appointed by the will of the Muslims, but imposed upon her. They are usurpers and have taken the authority away from the Ummah in order for the Ummah to realize her full potential and restore the honor that Islam has rightly given her. Then these false rulers must be replaced with a just Khalifa upon the method of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Finally, the most important lesson is that the institution of the Khalifa is a matter of life and death. A matter which Hussein radiallahu an gave his life, his family's lives, and the life of his son for. This was done in order to ensure that the seat of the Khilafah was not abused or usurped. The institution of the Khilafah is a political institution that is responsible for the implementation of all the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The rules, the regulations related to economy, foreign affairs, social affairs, judiciary, education, and others. Today when once again Islam does not exist, then it is the duty of the sons and daughters of this Ummah to carry out the struggle today according to the method of Prophet wasallam, to re-establish this deen and re-establish the political entity of the Khilafah. It is the Muslims that must now face the Yazids of our time and it is the Muslims today that must keep the example of Hussein radiallahu an clearly in their minds so that they may be we can truly reflect upon the tragedy of Karbala and truly learn the lessons from it. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu stajibu lillahi wa lil rasool idha da'akum lima yuhyikum O you who believe, respond to Allah and to the Messenger when he calls you to that which brings you life. Translation of the meaning of the Quran, Surah Al-Anfal, verse 24. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Podcasts on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran Tafsir, and Sirah are available at islampodcasts.com as well as on iTunes. Rate, review, and comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please subscribe, share and tell a friend about islampodcasts.com as well as rate review of iTunes. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Podcasts on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran tafsir, and sira are available at islampodcasts.com as well as on iTunes. Rate, review, and comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please subscribe. Share and tell a friend about islampodcasts.com as well as rate review of iTunes.